Over at bangthebook.com, you already know what to look for. Kyle's daily college basketball picks, Parker Michaels' daily NHL picks, daily NBA picks from Alan Moody, who also takes a look at totals and first half plays in both college basketball and the NBA. We'll have a good UFC preview from Christian Pina here this week. Uh, We've also got my golf preview for the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. We'll have soccer stuff. We'll continue to have NBA and college basketball stuff. Lots of great things going on over at bangthebook.com right now. So make sure you head on over there and check all that out. Also check out our Bang the Book YouTube page as well. Uh, We're going to pivot from the sharp money to taking a look at the Thursday college basketball card. Kyle will have that video up here later today. He also takes a look on Fridays for the Saturday college basketball card. So his two videos available every week. I've got a new video up there today looking ahead at some situational spots for this weekend. So lots of good things over on our Bang the Book YouTube page as well. Make sure you check those out. Then finally, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at Bet DSI. It's only a game until you bet it. Two guests on the program here today. We start things off with our leadoff hitter. That is Kyle Hunter from huntersportspicks.com. Kyle, how's it going today, man? Going all right, man. Uh, busy day, busy time over here right now. Yes, sir. Definitely is. And especially with college basketball, you know, everybody's primary focus here at this point in time. And good to get you on the Wednesday show. Of course, the problem is neither one of us is going to have any idea what the hell day it is the rest of the week. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be expecting the, the big Saturday card tomorrow, which, you know, that, that'll come here in a couple of days. But I do have to say that the Thursday college basketball card is always a pretty big one. So it makes sense for that to be a uh, preview video there over there at YouTube as well. Yeah, and definitely, as I mentioned there, we're going to pivot away from the Wednesday sharp money thing, just because from a lead time standpoint, takes a little bit of time to get that information and get that video done and put up there. So instead uh, Kyle will be taking a look at the Thursday card to go along with that Saturday preview video that he's already been doing. So, hey, at least, you know, since it is really busy, and I know that uh, both of us had long nights, me with insomnia, you with uh, with your son, hey, at least we're talking about the MAAC, a conference that you do know very well and have had a lot of success in. Yeah. Yeah, um, apologies for the dog here in the background. The puppy decided to <laughs> get upset about something. Um, uh I think maybe he's telling us that the underdogs have done well here in this conference, but actually, if we, oh, I like if it. we look at I it. I like it. Good segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, if we look at it, what really has done well here in the MAAC is the, the road team. Uh, we've talked about this before, I think, and actually, I have to be honest, when I was looking at notes for this here this morning, I felt like we had talked about the MAAC, and I had to kind of do a double take and go back through our email chain and see if maybe we had covered it before. I about the MAAC quite a bit in the following phase, so it wasn't actually the conference we previewed, but it was uh, one that we've talked about a decent amount. But uh, road teams have done really, really well here. 755, 591 ATS uh, since 2005. That's 56.1%. I believe this is the best conference of any of them as far as road teams. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty massive stat there. Underdogs have done just a little bit better than, than favorites uh, in the long term. Road dogs are 57% ATS since 2005, so um, that's a pretty good trend. And road teams are at 57.2% ATS when their opponent is coming off a road game in their last contest. So the first home game of this stretch, uh, that's been the best way to take the, the road teams is when the team's at the home for their first game. So I think the big takeaway here for the MAAC is is that, you know, road teams are, are the way to look. And uh, to be honest with you, I was looking at this. Every year it's been pretty consistent. It looked like last year was slightly weaker for the road teams than some of the other years. But, you know, they've consistently shown that home court advantage is overvalued here at MAAC. And this is a conference that is packed pretty tightly. A lot of these teams very close in a geographic sense. I mean, is that the reason why you think road teams have done so well? Or is it just, you know, maybe at a lot of these universities, there's just, there's not much of a crowd edge, just, you know, not much going on at home. Yeah, I I think it's both of those things. I think that, um, you know, every time I've watched an MAAC game, whether it be on, you know, ESPN Plus or, 
the rare game that's on TV. It doesn't seem like there's that much of an atmosphere. You know, nobody's really all that riled up about basketball there. And they're definitely packed close together. So I think both of those go together to, to make that at least some of the reason. Having said that, I still think 56.1% ATS for that long of a period. I mean, we're talking about 14 years. Uh, still surprising to me. You know, you, you would kind of wonder if that would regress to the mean a little bit, but every year it's continued to do pretty well. I, I do think that, you know, if you look at, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, it's likely that it won't keep hitting at 56.1%. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to be just backing home teams in this conference either. Well, and something I like about these conference-by-conference conference breakdowns, I mean, that that's not something that I was aware of. I'm sure it's not something most of our listeners were aware of. So, if you are in in the business of making your own power ratings and putting together your own numbers, obviously it looks like you need to take a little bit of home court advantage away, probably across the board here in this league. Do you already have, you know, below average home court advantages here or, you know, does digging up that type of stat encourage you to also change some of your numbers? Yeah, I do already have below average home court advantages, but I still wonder if I have, too much. You know, so as I look at these numbers, as consistent as they've been, you know, I think I might be given uh, too many points for home court advantage, even as it is. Yeah, I mean, you look at some of these uh, teams, you wonder, I mean, gosh, how much can you give them for home court advantage? Um, you know, these teams, like I said, I, I feel like it's a combination of they're packed so close together and there's just, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any kind of uh, atmosphere that would hurt the the road team much at all here. Um, I also wonder if at some point uh, teams have kind of realized that that road teams can do pretty well in this conference and it gives you more confidence because in some of the other conferences, you know, you think of Missouri Valley Conference, some of the other ones like that, uh, everybody knows it's really tough to win on the road. Um, You know, confidence and motivation uh, can go together and confidence can be pretty important in, in, in basketball, especially with youngsters. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say exactly what are all the reasons that somebody could hit, you know, they could hit 56.1% for that long of a time. Like I said, I think that, you know, the the support not being very big and then being close together it has to speak to at least some of it. But I, I kind of feel like 56.1% ACS is probably – Um, has something else factored in there. And I'm not really sure what the best answer is for that. So at your core, you're a totals guy. And, you know, we talk a lot of MAAC because it does seem like there are some pretty interesting totals angles here in this conference. Anything that you found for today's segment that you want to share? Yeah, the under is 675 and 667 since 2005. So we don't have any strong angle there. I do find this really interesting. Um, Low totals here have gone under at a high rate, and I know that that is kind of contrary to what you would think. Um, But the under is 101 and 73, 58% on totals of 133 or lower since 2005. I think that speaks to the fact that we have some teams in this conference that play really, really slowly. And when they play against each other, you can have some really low-scoring games. And I I think this is a really important point to make because – uh, it's one of the biggest ways that I've made money in total betting long term. And if you get a conference where some of the teams play really fast, and here you've got Ryder, Iona, uh, Niagara, teams like that playing really fast consistently, but you also have Siena playing really slowly, Manhattan playing really slowly, St. Peter's, Maris, teams like that. Uh, when those teams that play really slowly match up against each other, you can usually find some pretty solid value on the under. The reason for that is um, if you look at some of the recent games they've played, they've likely been pretty high, and and that's because they were playing against Iona, Niagara, uh, Ryder, teams like that, and now they're playing against another team who wants to play slowly. I I really think that's why the under has done well with the low numbers here is because there can be some massive pace wars in this league, and then when these slow-paced teams are playing against each other, you get a low total, but they even go under that because they're playing so slowly and they're not very good at offense. So uh, I think that describes why uh, why that has been at 58%. Now, you and I were talking a little bit before we started the show here today. Over at Bart Torvik's website, barttorvik.com, we've been citing Torvik a lot, and hopefully our listeners have added that to their 
you know, their regular rotation of research. The top team in the MAAC for Torvik is Ryder, 201st in the country. Ken Palm's got Ryder 193. That's his highest team. This conference blows this year. Oh, man, it's really, really bad. And as, as I mentioned to you, I mean, Ryder's definitely the best team in this league. You know, they haven't played like it the last couple games, which surprises me. But, you know, if you're if you're this league, uh, if you want to have a chance when it comes to the big dance of your your team having any kind of chance of pulling an upset, you really want Ryder to get through this because Ryder is by far the most talented team. Um you know, who's the second best team here? I mean, it's really hard for me to say who I think is the second best team in this league. I'll tell you who I think is playing some really good basketball right now with Siena. Um, this is a team where Jalen Pickett, a very, very good freshman for Siena, I think that he'll be the best player in this conference for quite a while um, in coming seasons. Siena, I really like the way they've been playing lately with Jamie on Christian's system. Uh, I've watched them play a few times. They slow the game down a lot. Um, they're taking care of the basketball. They play. They mix up the defenses. Play some interesting, you know, uh, traps, uh, presses that actually kind of slow the game down instead of speed it up. But uh, Jamie on Christian was a good coach there in the past, um, and now he's a first-year coach here at Siena. Uh, you know, I feel like he's a, a rising star in the coaching ranks. Um, after doing a good job at Mount St. Mary's, he comes over to Siena. Siena started the year playing pretty badly. They're playing much better here of late. They've won a couple games on the road. They won at Fairfield. They won at Iona. The thing that really uh, stands out to me is look at that game against Iona, 56-54 to 54 with a tempo of 57 possessions. Um, they forced Iona to play at their tempo, which is pretty hard to do. Yeah, and again, we talk about pace wars here in this conference and, and just, you know, how many different types of styles there are here. And, you know, as I look up and down this conference, man, I mean, it's, you know, you've got Iona, who's pretty good offensively, atrocious defensively. Quinnipiac is okay offensively, um, you know, not very good defensively. And, in fact, they're number one in the country in free throw percentage defense, for lack of a better term. So they're getting very lucky with teams missing at the free throw line. You've got Manhattan, who's second to the worst in turnover percentage on offense, and they're third in turnover percentage on defense. So their games are just nothing but throwing the basketball away on both sides. They're the worst free throw shooting team in the country. It's amazing that not only is there a lack of consistency with these programs overall, but in their statistical profiles. There's just, you know, they do one thing well and suck at the other thing. They do one other thing well, and they're terrible at another thing. This conference is – it's so – it looks high variance to me. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it is. I, I think uh, that it's funny that you say about Manhattan because uh, a couple weeks ago I tried to take a Manhattan over when it's a really – when it was a really low number. It did not work out. It was it was one of my bad plays. I will say that I watched that game a decent amount, and I really wish I hadn't watched that game. I mean, as soon as you said that, I, I kind of thought of that game right away. Uh, just constantly throwing the ball away back and forth. And and you think, man, I mean, it makes sense that they can have so many low-scoring games because they don't even get a shot. So, I mean, you know, it's it's, it's really ugly basketball. Um, I, I think Ryder, easily the best team in this conference. But you have a lot of other teams, like you said, like Manhattan, like Iona, to where they have some massive weaknesses. Um, you know, St. Peter's is a weak team as well. A lot of these teams, turn the ball over a lot, you know, not just uh, Manhattan. There's a lot of teams with turnover problems in this league. Not very many teams are very um, efficient on offense, but at the same time, you know, we don't have very many good defenses in this conference. So, um, you know, this is this is a conference where I would say that it would be one that would be interesting to try to find a uh, second favorite for uh, the conference tournament because I don't really know who it would be. You know, I mean, Ryder's going to be the favorite. I don't even know who the second favorite will be. You know, I think Monmouth is a better team than what their record would indicate, and uh, I think they're probably underrated when Ken Palm at 3-1. Uh, they're 7-4 and four in the conference. Uh, they haven't played the toughest schedule in the conference yet, but you know, um, I will say also Cameron Young, a very good player for Quinnipiac, and that's why they're 6-4 and four here. So maybe a team that has a good senior like Cameron Young 
uh, leading the way would, would have a chance in a, in a league like this. Uh, but, you know, there's so much inconsistency in this league that uh, it can be pretty hard to handicap, especially from a size standpoint. I, I really think that listeners should should keep in mind those uh, stats about road teams and then uh, road underdogs, uh, things like that, because, uh, you know, road teams have done really well here, and we have a lot of inconsistency. So if you can catch a road team getting too many points, uh, there's quite a few close games in this league. So um, if, if one team's on a bit of a run and then you catch a team, coming back home after that road trip, uh, playing against them with the road team getting points would make sense to me. Well, and I think, too, maybe this kind of speaks to the road angle. I mean, I haven't back-tested this or anything like that, but, you know, if you're good on offense and bad on defense or good on defense and bad on offense, it's very hard to create margin. So, you know, certainly you can see why there are a lot of close games here in this league and why, you know, the road teams, if they are a big underdog, probably worth taking even if they're bad because nobody in this conference really has that runaway and hide factor in any individual game because, you know, as I just mentioned, they're either really good on offense, really bad offense, and that's why Ryder is the best team here in this league because when you look at their their efficiency metrics offensively and defensively, they're the, one of the few teams where they're actually kind of close together. So there's some level of competency and consistency on both ends of the floor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean, there's no, if you think, you know, bigger scale, and I know that these are much bigger teams, but, you know, you take a, a Duke or a Gonzaga or somebody like that who's very good on both sides of the court, um, you know what you're getting on both ends, and you're able to create a margin, like you said. Here in the MAAC, if you're laying very many points with the team, you got to be worried because you know that they're either very weak on offense or very weak on defense or they have a massive turnover problem or something like that, it's hard to win by a margin if you're turning the ball over the, the kind of rate that some of these teams are in this league, especially if you're turning the ball over at this rate and you can't play good defense. So um, keep that in mind before you go to, to lay very many points in this conference that, uh, you know, it certainly could be hard to – to do that, and it looks like underdogs have done better here in the last couple of years than what they did before. So, um, you know, the, the underdog statistics that I gave you before are not really strong, but recently they've done pretty well, and I think that makes sense based on, uh, you know, as we look at the landscape of the MAAC right now. All right, so let's get into some game breakdowns here, and we'll go ahead and start actually on Thursday night. So I know we will look ahead to some weekend games here, but we'll also take a look at the Thursday night card A game down in the SOCON. We recently talked about the SOCON in one of our conference breakdowns. I think that was maybe – it was either last Friday or last Monday, one of the two. Uh, But Wofford and East Tennessee State is the game that you have your eye on for Thursday night. I was was hoping you were going to ask me what – you weren't going to ask me when we talked about that. I really really don't know. It's all kind of going together. But uh, Wofford and East Tennessee State, um, Wofford is undefeated here in the conference so far this year. They're the best team in the league, but I don't know that they're that much better than East Tennessee State. I'm curious to see what this line will be. Will Wofford be favored here on the road? I'm not sure they will be. I see Ken Palm has them projected to win this one by a point. Um, I think if I had to take a side here, I like East Tennessee State. Um, East Tennessee State's a good team as far as uh, defensively. They can create some turnovers. Very good on the glass. I remember us talking about that when we uh, spoke about them in this conference. Wofford very reliant on the three-point shot. I mean, they're very good at it. They shoot 40.8%. Um, in the conference, they're shooting 43.1% from three-point range. So very, very good shooting team. But, I mean, this is a, a team in East Tennessee State that's very good defensively, very well coached. Uh, you know, I think that this could be a spot where Wofford gets tripped up. You know, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I mean, clearly Wofford's an offensive juggernaut, but, you know, they're up against a really good defense here. Uh, It's important to point out that these two teams split the series last year, and each team won on the road. So both teams have proven they can win on the road. Uh, You know, Wofford's better than they were last year. They're quite a bit better than they were last year, mainly because their defense has improved a lot from last season. East Tennessee State, a team that is also somewhat better this year than they were a year ago, primarily because, um, you know, they're rebounding really, really well, and they're a little bit better on offense than they were last season. As I said before, 
I really think East Tennessee State's coach is underrated. Uh, done a very good job every year, replacing quite a bit. Uh, to me, this is one of those spots where Wofford, you know, comes into here undefeated in the league. They're going to lose at some point in this league. I'd be really surprised if they don't. Uh, this looks like a spot that that could be their loss. Well, when you look at when these teams last played, they played on December 1st, long time ago, very, very early start to conference play. And then, in fact, these teams got back into the non-conference portion of the season right after that. Wofford won that game 79-62. to 62. Uh, They did win that game at home. And also for East Tennessee State, that game gave up 1.167 points per possession, their worst defensive effort of the season. So maybe they do button it up here a little bit in this particular spot. But you know, as you mentioned for Wofford, and this is something you can look at with UNC Greensboro here in this conference as well, I don't think Wofford's really been tested on the road. I mean, they did blow out Greensboro for Greensboro's only loss, but you know, Greensboro, I think by all accounts, is kind of a smoke and mirrors team in this conference right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Greensboro's record in the league is better than what they are. I don't think they're a bad team. But, but um, yeah, I mean, this is going to be their toughest or Wofford's toughest uh, road game yet. And, you know, East Tennessee State doesn't exactly come into this game in any kind of bad spot. They haven't had any really, um, you know, huge opponent here of late. They've had time to get ready for this game. I mean, Wofford had, has as well as far as playing the Saturday, Thursday um, setups here in this league. You know, to me, uh, this is this is a dangerous spot for Wofford. You know, they have to be feeling pretty good about themselves being undefeated in the league. And like I said, I really don't think they're that much better than everybody else in the league. They're just going to run straight through this league. So um, curious to see what the line will be. If East Tennessee State is getting some points at home, I will definitely look that way. Um, I think that this one will be probably pretty close to a pick em. All right, so before we transition over to Saturday, Kyle, I, I do want to ask you here, you want to talk about any Friday night Ivy League, or are you good? <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I I never really want to talk about Ivy League. So, uh, you know, that's not, that certainly is not my preference for conferences at any point. So if you give me a choice of talking Ivy League or not, the answer is always going to be pass. All right, so we'll pass on that then. And obviously, I sound a little bit different. Blog Talk Radio up to its usual usual shenanigans. So I uh, had to reconnect back into the show with my cell phone. So apologies for that, but I'll do the best I can with the editing process. But in any event, we go over to Saturday, and let's go to the MAC. This is a big-time rivalry game that adds a little bit of importance here this year, given how these two teams are playing. Toledo and Bowling Green, 25 miles apart on I-75 and uh, not very many miles apart right now when it comes to conference play. Yeah, I want to talk about this game because, I mean, never are the stakes higher than what they are right now for a hoops game between these two teams. I mean, you know this, Adam, and anybody around Ohio knows that Toledo and Bowling Green are so close together, and they are big rivals. They really do not like each other. Um, They've had some really big rivalry games in college football, they also don't like each other, obviously, in college basketball. I'm really surprised at how Bowling Green has played so far this year. I think they're one of the most surprising teams in the country so far this season. Um, Bowling Green, 8-1 and one in the eastern side here of the MAC, ahead of Buffalo after that upset win over Buffalo. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they can end up winning that side of the east. I know Toledo would love to ruin it for them. Uh, Toledo is 7-3 and three in the west, which – uh, nobody else is better than five and four. So Toledo is certainly in the weaker side of the of the MAC here in college basketball. But you know, to me, the thing that separates this Toledo team from some of the ones in the past is Toledo is actually playing defense this year. And um, I had Akron and Ohio, and Akron and uh, Toledo, I should say, uh, first half under in the Bang the Book CBB article for last night. Um, and, and that one cashed in nicely. I mean, this Toledo team is, is getting some pretty high totals here of late because everybody's used to them being that really efficient offense who can't play any defense. They're 20th in the nation in, in effective field goal percentage defense, according to Ken Palm. Um, I don't think they're actually the 20th best defense in the country, but they're a lot better on defense than they've been in the past. You look at Bowling Green, this Bowling Green team, like I said, has been a huge surprise to me. They're very balanced. Um, Bowling Green 
is, is solid on offense, especially because they can knock down threes and get offensive rebounds. And on defense, they've been very good at um, getting the defensive rebound, not giving teams second chance points. And I've told you how important I think that is. You know, so I think this Bowling Green team has some of the fundamentals down. I thought that Bowling Green was going to fall apart because they played such a weak non-conference schedule. It has not happened that way. And uh, I'm, I'm very fascinated about this game as far as, as a fan. Um, my lean would be the under if I had to take something in this game because both of these defenses are better than people thought they would be. But Bowling Green is pushing the tempo. So, um, you know, I would need that to be at least mid-140s before I think about taking the under. Well, again, it may be a little bit early to start thinking about some of these angles, but, you know, in some of these conference tournaments, there are some significant edges to winning your division, being one of the top two seeds, something like that. Uh, the MAC has changed up a little bit. Used to have, you know, basically, I think it was a bye all, all the way to the semifinals. Uh, now I think it's just a bye into the quarterfinals. But, you know, in the MAC, they play the on campus sites with the early round games and, you know, all that different type of stuff. So, that will be a consideration here in some of these conferences as well as we move forward. But let's talk about a game, and you know I'm going to talk about this in the next segment here with Wes Reynolds as well, but so these rematch and revenge games, very, very interesting for a variety of different reasons. We've got one here this weekend in the CAA, the Colonial Athletic Association, between Charleston and Drexel. Yeah, I think this sets up as a really good spot here for Charleston, and and this will be one that I'll be looking at if I can play a a small enough number here. Uh, Ideally for me, Charleston wouldn't play very well in the game on Thursday night against Delaware, either loses that game or wins it really close so that we don't have too big of a number here in this game. But uh, Charleston should be really fired up for this game here against Drexel. Drexel beat them 79-78 to at the buzzer in the first game, and that was at Charleston. So now they have a chance at road revenge. Charleston was ahead 70-57 to with 8.20 left in the game um, in the first game. Then they blow that 13-point lead at home to a Drexel team that that most people thought was going to be one of the worst teams in this uh, conference. Now, Drexel's been a little bit better than most people would expect, uh, very efficient on offense. But Charleston is a much better team and a, a balanced team as compared to Drexel. This is a Charleston team that has been solid for many years. They have a couple really good players in Grant Riller and Jarrell Brantley. Um, You know, if they're laying a small enough number here, it's hard to not like them. The road revenge angle, like I've said in the past, is a strong angle overall in college basketball. I think this sets up as a pretty good spot for them to get revenge. Yeah, these are definitely the types of spots that you want to look for here at this time of the year in college basketball. And a game to mention here, and I want to make sure we've got enough time to, to dedicate to this game because this is a rematch. This is the two best teams in the country, really based on any rankings website you visit. Duke, Virginia, this time, though, in Charlottesville. Yeah, and if you take a look at the first game, you know, what was the reason that, that Duke was able to win that game? Duke had 31 free throws to Virginia at 17. Now, Duke only made 18 of 31, but still, uh, Virginia was 11 of 17. So they got seven more points from the line, and, and that ended up being the difference. Both teams shot the ball really poorly from three-point range in that one. Virginia, three of 17. Duke, two of 14. I will note that Craig Jones didn't play in that game. Uh, so that makes a difference for Duke as well. But, um, you know, it surprises me when you look at that game. I was kind of trying to figure that one out, that both teams shot so poorly from three-point range, and, and then you get, you get a 72-70 to 70 game that I believe went over the total, like with the last shot of the game. Um, you know, this is a uh, Duke team that is going to want to pick up the pace in a game like this. The first game really wasn't that fast-paced. What it was was they made a lot of their two-point shots. Duke made 65%. Virginia made 69.4%. Duke grabbed 10 offensive rebounds, only seven for Virginia. I think that could be the question again here. Um, You know, is Duke able to get a ton of offensive boards? They're very good on the offensive glass. Uh, Virginia pretty good at defensive rebounding, so um, they certainly will want to stick to their normal – when it comes to defensive rebounding versus what they did in the first game, because it's not usual for them to give up 10 offensive rebounds. But, you know, this clash of styles type game is, is one that we really like to talk about here. And, 
And if there was ever a clash of styles when Duke plays Virginia, it's, it's a massive clash of styles. Yeah, and I was looking at this one, and I actually mentioned this one uh, in that Wednesday weekend look-ahead video over on our YouTube page as well as that Toledo versus Bowling Green one. But, you know, that game against Duke, 1.145 points per possession allowed by Virginia, second only to their game against Maryland earlier this year, which was, you know, one of their bigger outlier performances in the non-conference that, you know, we've seen in, in quite some time here. So that's kind of what I'm wondering is, you know, is this total going to come out a little bit too high? I mean, you have an outlier performance for the Virginia defense. Both teams shoot exceptionally well from two-point range. You know, you did have – Duke with that free throw advantage that you mentioned, maybe this is the spot where you look to play the under. I mean, as you said, 63 possessions in that first game, maybe Virginia dictates tempo a little bit more at home in this one. I think that would be the way I would look in this game, depending on what that total comes out at. Yeah, I I agree with you totally. I think that, um, you know, the under makes a lot of sense, especially if you can get a high, you know, high 130s, 138, 139. Um, I, I think that, you know, that's probably about what this one will be. So uh, I think the under makes quite a bit of sense. Uh, Virginia is going to want to slow this game down, and really they had success slowing down the first game. It was 63 possessions, so it wasn't really able to run. And I will say Virginia usually doesn't foul very much, so you wouldn't really expect Duke to get 31 free throws again. Um, I, I think it would be concerning to lay too many points here with Virginia. Virginia is going to be favored, but, do you really want to lay four points or four and a half points or whatever it might be here um, against a Duke team that's so solid on both ends of the floor? I don't think I want to do that. Uh, at the same time, I don't really want to go against Virginia here. I think there's a good chance they win this game. I agree with you if I was going to be betting this game. The, the first thing I would look to bet would be the under. And not to say there's going to be any look-ahead factor for Virginia here. I mean, this game against Duke is you know, their biggest game at home, kind of their Super Bowl, so to speak. On Monday, Virginia's at North Carolina, which is a miserable turnaround to go and play in Chapel Hill. Very, very bad spot for the Cavaliers. So one that I think our listeners should definitely keep in mind uh, with us not doing a show on Monday to talk about this game again. Definitely circle that spot in your minds. Kyle Hunter, professional handicapper over at huntersportspicks.com and daily contributor to bangthebook.com. What's going on over at your website right now? Lowered prices there at huntersportspicks.com for college basketball, NBA, the rest of the season. As we get farther through the season, I've lowered that price, and you um, can check that out at huntersportspicks.com. Also, sign up for that free picks newsletter if you haven't already. And then thanks to everybody for checking out the daily work at, at bangthebook.com with the college basketball article and then the videos as well. Hey, make sure you follow Kyle on Twitter, at Kyle Hunter Picks. Kyle Hunter, appreciate the time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Sounds good, thanks.